I'll go through some of the um, freshwater species that are, have uh, the most potential in New Zealand for aquaculture. There's a, there's a wider variety of marine or estuarine type species that are um, suitable and a lot of even the freshwater species have a marine component to their life cycle. Um, some of the more promising marine species are things like the flounder that you can um, net as so on a high tide day they can come onto estuarine areas that may be part of your um, farm landscape and you can net those estuarine inlets off so that they're, they're stuck there and then as the tide retreats you can harvest them um, on the land, landward side of the nets or um, in a similar way you can uh, capture uh, mullet and you can strip them of their eggs and export that as, as roe which has a high, um, high value within Chinese markets in particular for its um, medicinal and, and food um, properties. Um, but we'll focus more on the um, purely freshwater species um, that, that may involve a marine component to their life cycle but their, their adult um, life is carried out within a freshwater environment. So in New Zealand um, our options are a little bit limited because we're quite a young country um, so the, the country itself has been um, sunk under, under the sea and, and been risen up again by tectonic activity and that has meant that uh, many of the life cycles of the fish have been adapted to um, having some components within within the sea because there, there hasn't been a, a long evolutionary period for um, life cycles to be adapted purely in, in a freshwater environment. Coupled with the, the high rainfall and steep topography of New Zealand means that particularly in winter um, a lot of our rivers are flushed out with, with a, high, um, a high flow of, of water and, and that disturbs the environments in those waters and, and often um, adults freshwater species will go out into the, the more protected marine environments and spawn there instead. But um, of most interest, um, they're not all native, um, the first three are, are not native, but the goldfish, um, particularly with aquaponic systems, has, has the most potential because in an aquaponic system it's in a, often in a, in a, in a heat, heated protected environment in a glasshouse. So a goldfish is the most um, resilient out of all these species as far as its ability to withstand low water temperatures and high nutrient levels that would commonly be associated with a high intensity production in, in the heated environment of a glasshouse. There may be um, other freshwater species um, of, a, of use in the aquarium trade like guppies or swordtails or mollies that you could also use. Um, the guppies, sawtails and mollies are all live bearers, so they, they can easily reproduce in those environments. Um, as far as the goldfish go, if you want to reproduce them, often you select out your breeding stock. You put it in a separate tank with a, a mesh um, fabric and um, they will spawn on, on, on that mesh fabric, which you can then remove and put into a fry rearing tank. Or you can even take the adults out, you can strip them of their eggs and their milk and um, fertilise the eggs that way um, in a separate tank and then just remove the adults away from it. But the goldfish have the advantage with an aquaponic system in particular of, of, of being able to be you know, adaptable in, in their nu nutritional requirements. So you can feed them with worms, with black fly larvae, with um, chopped up vegetable scraps, um, you can feed them with algae, you can dry down water plants and feed them with little um, dried up tablets of water plants um, such as duckweed is a good one for that so you can freeze dry duckweed and that would be a good goldfish food um, or you can rear various insects and, and feed them that too so they're quite adaptable in their um, diet which helps with um, feeding them particularly from sources that have come from that farm and uh, maybe an output of, of other types of production. So the worms and the black fly, for example, are a, a byproduct of the recycling of food scraps, but can also be harvested as a food source to feed your goldfish to, to help reduce the um, requirement for an input of resources to, to feed the fish. Um, so the, the, the main um, market that you're going for with goldfish is probably the aquarium trade. So to sell the one-year-old goldfish off to the aquarium trade, um, and there's a good market for that, particularly if you want to hit a niche 
um, species of goldfish that might be um, harder to source within the aquarium trade. You can um, specialise in the production of a few different um, types of goldfish. Um, the perch require a bigger environment, so they're best suited to an aquaculture environment, so where you've actually got ponds um, within a farm scale production system um, to give them the growing space that they require, but also they're more sensitive to, to um, lower low oxygen concentrations and high temperatures um, than goldfish are and they require a higher um, percentage of protein in their diet because they're a um, predatory fish so they they're in the nature they'd eat um, insects or other fish so they um, right up the f top of the food chain and, and, and those fish in general require a bigger um, habitat to, to support them with the food resources that that um, habitat can provide so if you're going to feed them naturally, um, the stocking rate needs to be even lower so that the, the prey um, that they feed upon have the opportunity to build up in, in population and they can feed naturally upon that. One way to control the um, number of perch might be to put them into a cage so you selectively um, put in a couple of adult perch into that cage uh, which may be stocked with uh, fish such as mosquito fish for, for which they can eat so that the mesh size of that cage allows those mosquito fish to, to get into that cage um, and the perch will eat them but they can't go outside of that cage and eat all the mosquito fish in that pond so you, you would need to supplement the feed um, of those perch with some other protein source from your farm whether it's insects or, or worms or, or whatever it may be. Um, the, so the benefit of a perch is um, it's fast growing, it's got a high reproductive rate and it's a good table eating fish and it can be legally um, farmed within New Zealand so there's not many species, freshwater species in New Zealand that can be legally farmed and, and perch is one of them and, it's a, and, and of the legally um, farmed species it's, it's the best eating by far. People even say it's better eating than trout um, and it's quite highly regarded and sought after in European countries. It's actually the national fish of Finland so um, people do regard its eating properties very highly overseas. Um, So some of the designs of a system that would suit perch um, would be uh, any, any kind of pond system that's within that um, farm scale environment. So you may want to do a system where the upper um, catchment ponds higher in the landscape um, are utilised for production of the, the foods um, fish for the um, perch. And they may be goldfish, it could be mosquito fish, it could be um, just uh, aquatic insects um, or insects from a terrestrial system such as worms or black fly larvae or um, cockroaches or crickets or whatever it may be they, they could all be um, reared for a food for perch um, but requiring a, a bigger pond you'd want to locate the perch a bit lower down in the landscape um, more um, at a, probably a similar elevation to where the main house sites are, so they may be your main aquaculture um, production system that's quite close to where the, the house is. And um, the design of that pond, when you do it, would, you'd need to ensure that there's some way to harvest the perch. So they're either in a cage where you can harvest them directly out of that cage, or there's a channel that you can drain that pond and remove them um, from it. Um, one of the advantages of draining the pond and removing them from a channel is that even in a cage they can spawn and build up a number um, within that pond and if the density of the perch gets too high in the pond then um, it's harder to control their food source within that pond because they um, over consume it and that reduces the size of the perch so you get a lot of small perch instead of a few nice um, table sized perch so it's good to be able to regularly drain that pond and to restock it quite intentionally with only a few perch um, and you, once you know they've, they've grown to a year or two in size to be able to drain that pond and, and harvest them out of it. Um, some of the other options um, are more 
appealing as far as the value of the product goes, but it's more complicated in their life cycle and, and longer to maturity as well. Um, the salmon um, fetches a good price and in some situations in New Zealand where you can um, perhaps um, use spring water or redirect water from a, from a natural flowing um, stream or a river system, you could set up some nice um, shaded um, cool water, high flow rate um, production systems that would be suitable for salmon. But you have to keep in mind that um, they don't tolerate any, any um, low water quality or, or a dropping off of flow rate. So you, you'd always need to make sure that the water through that system is kept cool and well oxygenated and, and well shaded and has a good flow rate to um, not kill them all and lose all your production, so that would be a, a consideration with salmon. But it fetches a high um, value, it could be incorporated within aquacultures, so aquaponic systems, so the water that's coming off those salmon systems could then go through um, production systems, rearing um, vegetables or, or production of plants, so they could be incorporated within aquaponics that way. Um, but you need to make sure that the water before it goes back into the salmon system is, is being filtered well so that there's not a build up of contamination because they're also um, very sensitive to any build ups and uh, contamination of the water. So after going through an aquaponic system for example it could be filtered through a wetland or a reed system um, and as long as there's good shade to keep that water cool um, the temperature may still be adequate to, to flow back through that um, salmon farm and, and um, feed through your production. And that may require some um, of the water to be flowing underground to, to make sure that it's kept cool before it flows back into the tanks um, where the salmon are being kept. So that it's, the water is, is being kept away from the sun as much as possible so that it doesn't um, heat up too much. Um, some of the other production are, are native species, so the eel and white bait um, are both native to New Zealand, um, but they have the challenge of their life cycle being um, involving a marine element. So the, the eels, for example, um, spawn in New Zealand, well, um, the, the adults, they grow to maturity in New Zealand, but they spawn in Samoa. And, and the way that happens is that um, if you consider where New Zealand's land masses and Samoa land masses, there's um, some deep currents um, flowing from the Antarctic towards the equator, so they're flowing northwards from the um, from the Antarctic to, towards the equator. So the adult eels, when they're ready to spawn, will, will go through a metamorphosis where they um, produce a lot of brown fat, which is the, the type of flat fat that um, hibernating animals use. And they'll drop down low in, in the ocean outside of New Zealand where those currents are that will take them up towards the equator. And they'll spawn um, by Samoa. And then when the baby eels or the alvers, um, when, when they're at the, the, the first stage, they're called glass eels because they're very transpar transparent and um, leaf shaped. So these glass eels um, will hatch out. Um, they'll be part of the phytoplankton mix that's on the um, surface of the ocean. And then the currents um, on the surface are warm. So they're being warmed at the equator and then they're being pushed southwards again. So those currents will um, direct the, the baby glass eels back towards New Zealand. And then once they get around the shores of New Zealand, they've, they've matured a bit and they're called alvers at, these stage, at this stage. And alvers are just very small um, miniature adults. So they've got that um, snake-like shape and they're, they're normally quite dark colored by that stage and they'll, they'll start to then swim up the rivers. So this, um, complex life cycle makes it um, not possible to breed eels within New Zealand but the aquaculture of them is more associated with the capture of these alvers as they're migrating up freshwaters and then um, being able to keep them in a, in a certain location and grow them to maturity. So most commercial eel 
um, systems are, are associated with wild capture of eels, but there are some which um, make use of the, the yearly migration of elvers up into rivers and they'll, and they'll capture that, that um, annual input of elvers and they'll grow them to maturity and then sell the, the adult eels. The, the problem there is the slow maturity of the eels, so they could take anywhere six, seven years to, to reach maturity to, to be able to sell. So it's a, it's a very slow growth rate involved as opposed to you know, one year for a, for a goldfish or a perch to be able to get to a size where you can either sell them in the pet industry or, or be able to eat them. So it's a, a lot slower rate. Even the salmon um, you can harvest within a couple of years um, as a table fish. Um, the other opportunity is the white baits. The, the benefit there is your, um, your product is, is the baby, which um, obviously uh, doesn't need to mature for very long at all. So it's, uh, it's just a couple of month old baby, so it's, it's, it's a very um, fast rate of production as far as the baby um, fish goes. The white baits themselves are galaxied species, so they're, they're mostly Inanga, which are a type of um, galaxied fish that spawn in the estuary areas, um, so they're, they're, they're areas quite close to the sea. And during the um, last tides of, of summer, um, which tend to be quite high, um, so when, when you get a bit of autumn flooding to, to the rivers, and, and the rivers tend to, to get quite high in, in early autumn stage, the adult Ananga will spawn amongst all the um, riparian cover uh, in those estuaries and then they drop down again and then the next flood that comes through generally a week or two later those eggs will hatch out and the baby Ananga will then drift out into the ocean where they'll mature and then come back three or four months later as, as baby white baits that are commercially harvested. So like the um, eels that requirement of that marine stage in their life cycle makes it hard to use them in aquaculture but there's other galaxied species such as the banded and, and um, giant kokapu which are also galaxied species that are bigger and they can form landlocked populations so you can um, spawn them entirely in a freshwater habitat and, and they don't need to leave that habitat like the eels and the ananga do so they'll actually spawn in the, in the habitat that they occupy as an adult without having to migrate. And then the baby um, kokapu species in nature would most commonly go out to the sea and then come back as white bait like the Ananga would. But um, they, can also, um, they can also grow within a freshwater system and that's often within lakes um, in particular. Um, they'll grow to an adult stage, uh, a baby stage, and then migrate into the headwaters of those lakes and those ponds um, to, to occupy the habitats as an adult. So you can make use of that life cycle and grow them with an aquaculture, aquaculture system, and Nee was looking at different ways of doing that. Um, so in that context, the, the giant kokapu, which is a bigger fish which would produce more eggs and therefore more white bait, is the one that they're most interested in and you'd need to um, collect those adults, um, hand milk them to collect the sperm and the eggs and fertilize those eggs that way. And you could get uh, up to two um, mil miltings a year of those giant kokapu if, if, uh, if you uh, kind of simulate the natural um, dynamics of the seasonal variations and just kind of condense the seasons a little bit, you should be able to get them through two spawnings a year. Um, and you've just got to pay attention to the, 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 difference, uh, the differences that occur within their natural habitat that are the cues for their spawning. So the, the flooding of those habitats um, after a period of, uh, of long day lengths and, and high amounts of food availability and then the flooding of those habitats after a period of, of reduced um, volume will, will initiate them to spawn. So if you go through a period where they've um, gone through that, so it's been warm, there's been an abundance of food, the water levels have dropped a bit and then you flood it, that, that's normally the um, environmental cue that would stimulate them in nature to spawn. So at that time um, you can control their environments to replicate those conditions and then flood it, um, collect the adults, um, milk them of the eggs and the sperm, um, 
collect them separately, raise uh, the white bait up for three or four months, so you'd need to be able to produce a, a small food for them, um, whether it's a rotifer or some other small um, phytoplankton that they'd eat. Um, and then once they're to the three or four months are old, you can then um, collect them and sell them commercially as white bait. So they have quite um, a good option there. Again, you can incorporate them with other production methods, but um, like the salmon, they like um, cool, well oxygenated, um, clean and water environment. So you've got to pay very careful attention to the water flow and the oxygen levels and the, and the nutrient concentrations to make sure that the habitat is, is uh, kept to the optimal conditions that they prefer.